Uh, so welcome everybody to Trent University's virtual winter open house um, and today it's so we're very excited to welcome you to the session for the School for the Study of Canada. My name is Lucy Connolly and I'll be moderating this session and with me today I have Dr Whitney Lackenbauer who is a professor in Canadian studies. Um, I also have with me Dr Heather Nicholl who is the director of the School for the Study of Canada um, and Emily Dew who is a fourth year student in the programme. Um, so we're very excited to see you here and for the path that you have ahead of you at Trent, hopefully. Um, and we look forward to sharing all of the reasons why Trent has been ranked the number one undergraduate university in Ontario for the last 11 consecutive years. Um, so during the session, you can ask any questions in the chat. And at the end of the session, we'll have a short question and answer period with the members of the panel. So if you do have any questions, do please put them in the chat box. Um, you can find it at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we'll get to those questions um, at the end of the presentation. Hopefully we'll get all the, all the answers you need. Um, the presentation is being offered with closed captioning today. Um, so if that's something you would like to do, you can enable the closed captioning by selecting the three dots on the bottom right of your screen and selecting show subtitles. And hopefully those will pop up on your screen um, as soon as you've done that. <laughs> Uh, we've still got some more live chats happening today, although obviously they'll all be wrapping up in the next half an hour, so I hope you will stay with us and not go join them. Um, but if you do decide to do that, find one that won't answer any more questions that you have. Um, we'll get started with our presentation now. Dr. Lackenbauer, take it away. Great, well, thanks. What an honor to be here and speaking to prospective Trent students. Uh, as Lucy mentioned, I'm Whitney Lockenbauer. I'm a professor in the School for the Study of Canada, and I'm also Canada Research Chair in the Study of the Canadian North. I was trained as a historian, but decided to, to move to Trent about four years ago because I love Canadian studies and everything that it represents. Bringing together conversations from different disciplines and really thinking about not only what our country has been, what it is today, but what we can make of it as we build forward. And what you see here on a screen is a kaleidoscope of different projects that I've worked on in my career. You'll see a lot of snow and ice. A lot of my research actually takes me up to the Canadian Arctic. And I specialize quite a bit in, in relationships between Canada as a country and our fellow citizens living in Nunavut, the Northwest Territories and Yukon, as well as our provincial Norths. Here's a sample of some of the books that I have come around this year. So I'm busy as a researcher, as many professors are, and really love to work with students in co-creating knowledge with partners all across Canada to bring stories to life and to really get us to think about what questions we're desirous of not only asking, but answering as Canadians. And as I see it, Canada is just an assemblage, a collection of a whole bunch of relationships. And as much as I'm a professor, one of the things that keeps me going and animates me is a complete driving curiosity, a desire to learn more. And that every time I think I have something figured out, it seems to invite more questions that I want to explore. So I hope you'll come to Trent and join me in the conversation and the discussion in the road ahead. But I thought I'd do something a little different today for the next 12 minutes or so, and give you a sample of what a lecture might be like in Canadian studies. So I teach a course, Canadian Studies 1100, Conflicted Canada, and I love to have built this course around a series of sketches, biographical sketches, that illuminate an aspect of Canada. And I thought, Canada, we've just wrapped up the Winter Olympics. Olympics. Our women did us very proud, and so did our men, even though they didn't come home with a medal. Right? And I thought about hockey. And Ken Dryden, who was a former goalie with the Montreal Canadiens in the National Hockey League, president of the Toronto Maple Leafs, so I'm not biased in favor of Montreal here, then a federal cabinet minister once said, hockey is part sport and recreation, part entertainment, part business, part community builder, social connector and fantasy maker. It's played in every province and territory in this country. And though its symmetry is far from perfect, hockey does far better than most in cutting across social division. Young and old, rich and poor, urban and rural, French and English, East and West, abled and disabled. I might also add indigenous, non-indigenous, long rooted in Canada and newcomer. It's this breadth, this reach into the past that makes hockey such a vivid instrument through which to view Canadian life. And that's what Canadian studies is about, glimpses of Canadian life and understanding can Canadian life. So hockey is often regarded as a common Canadian experience, but this shared passion for Canada's game can also be a reflection of our identities 
within the country. Ice hockey can also reinforce social divisions. And for French Canadians in the middle of the 20th century, in the middle of the 1900s, there was certainly a Canadian team. Les Canadiens de Montréal, the Montreal Canadiens, first and foremost, a French Canadian team. I should say the French Canadian team. And no French Canadian hockey player captured the imagination more than Maurice Richard, the Rocket, one of the most explosive players in hockey history who became the embodiment of French Canada on skates, who dazzled audiences with skill and determination, as well as a fiery temper. A fiery temper. And as much as he was loved in Montreal and French Canada, he was hated in rival cities throughout North America. So hockey can be a great source of nationalism and unity as we find around Olympic time, but it can also be a source of division. And in this little sketch, we're gonna see how it boiled over in 1955, that when the rocket was suspended that year, it proved that hockey embodied competing nationalisms in Canada. And on the surface, the riot that broke out over his suspension was an expression of frustration and outrage by hockey fans furious that their top player was suspended. But when we, when we consider the influence of the symbolic identities that had formed around the rocket and the NHL president Colin Campbell at the time and their stormy relationship, his suspension, the riot that followed takes on a whole new and much broader set of meanings anchored in the longstanding relationship between English and French Canadians. So hockey is a form of cultural nationalism in Canada, sure, but also nationalisms. So when I teach about Rocket Richard, I ask a series of, of questions about popular culture and sport in Canadian life, about how all of these ideas around hockey are really embedded in our sense of identity and our society and some of the underlying tensions within Canadian society. I think about the public opinion and the press and how it shapes our ideas, but also inflames some of our primordial passions. And when I think about an individual like Maurice Richard, I have to humanize them. Why was he held in such high esteem throughout his career and beyond? Well, in French Canada, it's because French Canadians saw Richard as one of their own. Every aspect of his background, his upbringing was rooted in French Canada. The language he spoke, the religion he practiced, the education he received, the financial hardships he endured, had a French Canadian working class flavor. And this background provided the foundation upon which his future rise to stardom and heroism was based. Because French Canadian fans were well aware of his lifestyle outside of hockey, they recognized that in many ways this hockey superstar was just like them. Even after he became a professional hockey player, his direct connection to the French Canadian working class continued. It's hard to imagine today that at the end of each hockey season, professional hockey players who didn't or earn the exorbitant salaries that they do today usually had to find work in traditional blue collar occupations. So up until the 1950s, it was actually common to find fans working alongside their hockey heroes in big city factories and in the mines during the off season. And Richard fit this. During his early years in the NHL, which overlapped with the Second World War, he worked as a machinist at a tank factory when he wasn't playing hockey. So he was good at God on the ice, but at the same time, French Canadians knew at the end, he wasn't really different from them. So we can certainly look at his career, how he overcame the odds to make the NHL his accomplishments. That's the stuff of hockey fans, right? We're at university to talk about Canada and Canadian studies, to get a sense of what he represented in his style of play, his aggressiveness, his recklessness, what fired up fans, that fire in his eyes that was legendary, why he earned that nickname of the Rocket, and how this infused French Canadians with pride and self-confidence like nobody else, that this background turned him into an instant French icon that uploaded what he referred to as his people each and every time he took to the ice. And as a hockey columnist, Red Fisher put it at the time, ever since the Plains of Abraham, ever since that moment in the mid 1760s when the British defeated the French to seize control of New France, he said, the French people have been number two, but on the ice, they're number one. That's what Rocket Richard made them believe. He was involved in various on-ice confrontations that continued to, to feed his heroic and symbolic stature within French Canada, bringing into relief what he seemed to represent and what was seen as the racism or anti-French bigotry of the NHL establishment. He was legendary for his temper, which was a reflection of the ferocity that he brought to the game, 
But it's also interesting that he provided French Canadians with a popular two-sided masculine role model. So on the ice, all these physical and aggressive qualities sometimes associated with mid 20th century masculinity. Off the ice, the responsible, mature, absolutely devout family man. One commentator said, if French Canadians identify with Richard, it's above all else because he incarnates the French Canadian type, hardworking, courageous at the same time, a model of simplicity and modesty. Maurice Richard greatly resembles a neighbor or parent. He's part of the family. So known as much for his demeanor away from the game as on the ice, he became this paternal role model, held up as the perfect father who is warm and caring and generous and responsible. And when we read stories like this, it tells us something about what expectations were along gender lines at the time that we're studying and what that tells us about the society. But make no mistake, he became an icon, a symbol of what French Canadians should and could aspire to. A famous Canadian author, Hugh McLennan, wrote in Saturday Night Magazine that French Canadians see in Richard not only a person who ideally embodies the fire and style of their race, interesting, they talked about French Canadians as a race right back in the 1950s, but they also see in him a man who from time to time turns on his prosecutors and annihilates them. At the moment, Richard has the status with some people in Quebec, not much below that of a tribal god. We see in the image here, right? Like he was kind of like a Superman. And my mamere, my, my maternal grandmother, described Richard as my prepare, my, pater, my maternal grandfather's patron saint. She used to say to me, of course, Richard could never do anything wrong. He was never to blame, even though he was the biggest brute on the ice. We never blamed him. It was everybody who was blaming him or who was bugging him that was to blame. And my grandparents listened to him on the radio and then eventually watched him on their fuzzy black and white televisions. He was their hero through and through like he was for most French Canadians. And some of you may have seen the hockey sweater. And I love it because I don't know that any story better captures Richard's central position in French Canadian life than Roche Carrier's famous story. I love to discuss this with students, even though it's a children's story. I think it's a great way to glimpse how all pervasive hockey was in French Canadian life and how the rocket was this universal hero. And when we talk about this, I also situate Richard's story in that of what was going on in French Canada in the 1940s and 50s, at a time when French Canadians were more aware of their inferior social and economic status and resentment was growing towards the English big bosses who seemed to run the show economically. How is it fair that the English had all the power and financial control? These were the thoughts going through the French Canadian workers who were organizing into labor unions, fighting for more rights at this time. So it's not a surprise that when they looked at the NHL and saw that it was dominated by Anglophones, by English speaking people, they, they saw it also replicating the structure with the English on top and French Canadians on the bottom. So when Maurice Richard challenged the league in 1955, we can see him as a French Canadian player and social icon who is rebelling against the English Canadian authority structure of the league, right? Not a far stretch to establish them with parallels with society at large, right? Here's their, he's their working class hero fighting for the same justice in hockey as they're fighting for in their businesses in Quebec society. I then set him up into contrast with his anti-hero for looking at it from a French Canadian standpoint. Clarence Campbell, the president of the NHL, who was opposite to Richard in just about every respect, and how they came to exemplify French and English Canadian identities, and how after a brutal altercation in a hockey game on 15th of March 1955, set in motion a dramatic series of events, Richard struck a referee, Campbell suspended him for the rest of the season of the playoffs, this set off a storm of debate and controversy that divided French and English Canadians and ultimately changed the face of French Canada. Four days later, it came to a head on St. Patrick's Day in 1955, when 15,000 Montreal Canadian fans waited for the arrival of the NHL President Campbell in the Montreal Forum. He said he was going to attend the game that night. They'd already made threats of him, but he'd sat back and said he was not going to go and, and not show his resolve. This certainly not only had Campbell exercising his authority and rights, but also reminded all French Canadian fans, there was nothing they could do to overturn the suspension of their idol and perhaps reminded them of the lack of control they had over their own destiny, not only in the arena, but outside of it. 
And the anger soon went to, from throwing things at Campbell while he was in the arena to somebody setting off a tear gas bomb, leading to everybody being evacuated, 15,000 enraged fans flowing onto the streets and mob hysteria spreading through the streets of Montreal. And of course, newspapers leapt into the debate, French language newspapers taking the lead in blaming Campbell for inciting this riot, suggesting he was provocative. And as one headline put it, what business did he have showing up at the altar of the forum? Think about that word altar and the, the religious connotations about how they saw that arena, right? Hockey and religion blending together when the rocket was involved. And Andre Laurendeau, the most famous French Canadian nationalist newspaper at the period, wrote a, a remarkable article talking about the affair and its reaction that I love to break down with students. It was called, On a tué mon frère Richard. Someone has killed our brother Richard. Not only looking at the incident itself, but tying it to a much larger set of social and historical and political concerns, drawing direct parallels to French Canada more generally, and what he saw as a strong sense of nationalism simmering just below the surface, waiting to explode. So this whole affair to them was about this pent up anger and injustice amongst French Canadians playing out through Campbell and Richard and suggesting that maybe this was a moment when French Canadians had to really consider what their future was going to look like. He compared specifically with the title of this, this story, the passion behind French Canadian support for, Louis, for Maurice Richard to that which Louis Riel, famous Métis leader who we always talk about in the course, that he received from French Canada in the 1880s. And you can imagine in English Canada, it was the opposite. Everybody blamed Richard for being a brute and said Campbell was the up, upright, you know, civil person doing his duty and his honor. So then we talk about the meaning of the riot. Was this fan hooliganism or should we read into it more political and cultural significance? Some commentators have gone so far as to suggest this was the moment that started the ball rolling towards Quebec's quiet revolution that transformed the province and indeed transformed Canada in the 1960s. Was this the spark that ignited French Canada collective action to ensure they would no longer be held back by the English establishment in general? I say this is probably going too far, but in social terms, one can't help but be left with the sense that the Richard riot contained many of these emotions and passions that really meant something to the average French Canadian. Yes, politics are politics. They can cause frustration and oppression, but politicians are remote from working class Quebecers. And work is work. Your factory is owned by the English, but what could you do? You need a job to feed your family. But this was hockey. This was the Montreal Canadiens, l'équipe nationale, the French Canadian national team, to suspend the rocket, their spokesperson, their hero, one of them, not some big shot businessman or aloof politician, that was going too far. Was nothing sacred? Were the English now out to kill all of their dreams through whatever means necessary? To learn more, you can take Canadian Studies 1100, Conflicted Canada, where we look at this story and others, the great Canadians and infamous Canadians who have shaped our country's past and present and join in this great conversation that we have in Canadian Studies with people like Emily talking about our country. And as I said, where we've been, where we are, where we're going. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much for such an enthusiastic taste of what it might be to be a student in Canadian studies. That was very, extreme, very interesting. Um, so we'll move over to asking Emily some questions now about what it's like to be a Trent student. Uh, so Emily is in her fourth year of her program, so she's she's been through it all, she knows it all. Um, what do you love about your program? Yeah, so my favorite thing about Canadian studies is the diverse like, options you have for courses. So I added um, an option in Indigenous Reconciliation and Resurgence, um, as well as an emphasis in law and policy. And this was super easy to do. It was easy to get the credits I needed. Um, you just have to make strategic course selections. And it also really set my degree apart when I went to apply to post-grad um, schools. So I 
I chose Canadian studies when I was 15, maybe 16. And to be honest, at that point, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So when I went to choose, I wanted to choose a program that would open the most doors for me. Um, and after Trent, there's so many things you can do with a Canadian studies degree. I'm going to law school this fall, um, but I also could have gone into research or politics. I could have done a master's. I could have gone to work in the nonprofit se sector. Um, I never really felt pigeonholed in Canadian studies, and I really enjoyed all the di diverse courses that were a part of my degree. So that might be a good time to ask you, um, Professor Nicol, what, what's the structure of the degree program like? in terms of our other required courses? I mean, it sounds like it's very flexible. There are lots of electives. What's, what's it look like to a typical student? It is, in fact, a very, very flexible program. We have what we consider, um, you know, the foundational must-take courses are mainly in the first year. So you're asked to take several of the first year courses. And after that, we have um, three or four, um, we'll call it, um, areas or streams of uh, thematic areas that you can choose courses from, but they're highly interdisciplinary. So that you're very, it's very, very open. If you're interested in Canadian politics and you don't want to do a degree in Canadian political studies, for example, you can in fact specialize more or less in courses um, in political studies within Canadian studies and get credit for that. Uh, we do have some courses that we highly recommend. One of our flagship courses is Canada, the land. And that really brings you, and Emily's nodding because you've taken that course with, yes, it's a wonderful course. And uh, it brings students into contact with, you know, this broad sense of what Canada is as a land, not as a state, but as a land, as a place, uh, connections with environment, with people, with literature, um, with other kinds of aesthetics. So, uh, but apart from that, then we've got courses uh, that you can choose from our own courses, which can't run anywhere from law, which uh, Emily, you mentioned you're going into law. So you would have taken our, our foundations a canon of the role of law. We've got new courses in, um, in, in leadership, change leadership. We've got courses in, um, Really, we, we focus on, on all aspects of Canadian life, whether it's the arts, whether it's you know, heavily you know, humanistic literature, uh, you can choose courses from there. You can move into history. You can look, you know, be much more focused on uh, Canadian law. We have specialists in, excuse me, Canadian history. We have specialists in, you know, cultural, constitutional history, political history, um, Arctic history. Uh, you know, it's just, wide open but the point is you don't have to uh, be limited by uh, a number of core courses it's very flexible and I, and I think that's what makes it a, a truly unique degree. Okay great thank you very much um, so we'll go back to Emily again um, and what advice do you have for a student who is planning to come and study in Canadian studies at Trent? Yeah, my, my biggest word of advice would be to make use of the cross listing um, at Trent and choose classes that you might not have taken otherwise. So I took courses in international development and indigenous studies, political studies, gender studies, history. Um, I even took a philosophy course once and all of those counted towards my degree in Canadian studies um, just because they were cross listed with CAS courses. So if you don't know exactly what you want to do with your degree, definitely use your time at Trent to figure it out. And um, the other thing is to use academic skills. It's a free support program at Trent and they proofread um, up to five papers a semester, which is huge, um, especially in Canadian studies when you're writing those 30, 40% final papers, um, because that's something that Canadian studies professors love to assign. <laughs> that sounds like a great piece of advice. <laughs> Good to know those services. Don't be as charged, Emma, again, don't be as charged. <laughs> Okay, um, and anybody who is interested in getting more information from you about Canadian studies, what's the best way of getting in touch? Is there an email address that I can drop into the chat that people can answer, ask their questions for? Yeah, of course. Um, my email is just emilydo at Trent U. Um, I check that multiple times a day, so I'm pretty quick to respond. Okay, well, that's great to offer yourself up for that. Um, and is there a departmental contact that would be the best? Yeah. 
you it's so easy to remember canadian studies at trentio.ca okay i think you can manage to get that so you down without too many problems this is a tricky perfect so anything going to I don't know, anything going to Emily for student questions, anything going to Canadian studies at Trent U for departmental questions? Yeah, I should mention, uh, we do have lots of great opportunities for scholarships. We have, um, um, you know, not just scholarships, but also awards and prizes. Uh, and uh, in that sense, we're pretty, we're pretty uh, competitive department and we have funding for a lot of events and we're lucky in that that sense to be a little bit well healed so that you are a little bit more able perhaps to get some kind of financial recognition um, if you choose this program. Okay, that's also very good to know. Uh, so we've only got five minutes or so left before Open House finishes for the day. Um, so I think we'll just start to wrap things up here. Um, and I'd just like to say that we are um, encouraging everybody to come visit us in person at Trent at the moment now that things are reopening. So we've got, we have got in-person real life open houses coming up um, upon January, uh, sorry, not January, May the 7th for the Peterborough campus and the 30th of April for the Durham campus. And I just put um, the link into the chat box about how you can register for those programs there for the open houses that are coming up in person. Um, and there are also, we're offering in-person tours as well. So we'd be very happy to see anybody and everybody coming and visiting us. Um, on an in-person tour March break we've got extra time slots available just because people maybe have some more time to come visit us then. Um, so thank you very much to all the members of the panel for being here today and sharing their knowledge with us. Um, the session has been recorded, um, it'll be posted to the Open House webpage hopefully by the end of next week so you can get to come back and look at the session again um, or indeed any of the other sessions that have taken place today. Um, we're open house is finishing in about three o'clock, um, but all those sessions are recorded and be available to watch by the end of the next week. Um, if you think of any questions at all after the event, um, then you can email Trent at discovertrent at trentu.ca. That's just the general email address. It might take a few days to get go around the houses and get forwarded to the right place, but it will happen. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>